Hey, I got an awesome question in this week and so I wanted to share this with you guys. The question is, why do people self-harm? I have a friend who started cutting and I don't understand why they just don't stop. Really good question. So by definition, self-harm or self-injury means that you're hurting yourself on purpose. And just to clarify, self-harm in and of itself is not a mental illness. What it actually is, is this behavior that's indicating that you are struggling with managing your feelings. It's a coping mechanism. And so self-harm typically is a response and guys, this is why it's really important for us to have some compassion towards it. It is typically a response and some form of that person trying to cope with severe, severe physical or emotional trauma, physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, something along those lines is happening in a severe way. And severe may mean incidental trauma to be said, like one incident, like they were raped. Or it can be complex trauma. It can be something that's been very small, but it's been happening over and over and over for a long period of time, like always being ignored by a parent, right? And so if you were to ask what's wrong, they have a tr trouble really putting a finger on it. But both types of traumas are one of the main sources of any kind of self-harm. So what this person is trying to create for themselves when they self-harm, when there's any self-injurious behavior, is a state change or this release of all of the negative feelings and uncomfortable and painful feelings that they're experiencing emotionally. So ultimately, they're just trying to help themselves feel better. Let's take a second to put ourselves in the shoes of someone who is injuring themselves on a regular basis. It starts with this overwhelming anger, frustration, sadness, grief, shame, these overwhelming feelings that they are having trouble coping with. And so often one thing that's tied to these overwhelming feelings is this idea of secrecy. It's not something they can either put their fingers on or it's something they certainly don't feel safe talking to someone about. So any of you who've experienced intense emotions know it is incredibly difficult to get through your day when you're experiencing something like that. It's almost impossible to think about anything else when you're experiencing overwhelming emotional feelings, much less go to work, go to school, attend an important event, be in any kind of social situation. And so what this person is trying to do is discharge these feelings simply so they can get through the rest of their week, get through the rest of their month. They're just trying to get through. What they do is they start with something small like slapping a rubber band on their wrist or flicking themselves or pinching themselves or causing themselves to bruise in certain areas that might be hidden by clothing. When our body experiences something really painful, and that can be physically painful or emotionally painful, what our body does in response to that is it drops all these hormones, these pain preventing, pain killing hormones and neurotransmitters. Uh, excuse me, neurotransmitters, like mood enhancing neurotransmitters into our system to help us cope with that painful situation. And think about it guys, that's kind of a really awesome, beautiful thing that our body does as it drops these chemicals into our body to say, you know what, I'm, let, me make, let me take the edge off, right? It's, our, it's its own form of drinking or drug abuse, right? Our body says, you know, it's too much for you to handle, so let me just go ahead and soften this blow a little bit for you. And if you think about it, back in the caveman days, people died horrible deaths and experienced horribly painful situations. They were eaten alive, they would starve to death, they would freeze to death. And so it's kind of an amazing thing that our brain creates this system that prevents us from suffering quite as much. So. This is why it's so important that we acknowledge if something like this is happening with someone, that we handle them and speak to them with such, such kindness. Such kindness, such compassion, because there is no one who's gonna be harder on them than themselves. Even if they're defensive, even if they appear to be self-righteous about the behavior or whatever's happening, just know the person that's underneath all of that 
that's doing that behavior is feeling really vulnerable. And it's important for us to be really gentle with them. It is one, not as uncommon as you might think. According to this review, I looked up earlier, according to a review of 52 self-injury studies in 2012 from all around the world, approximately 18% of people cut or deliberately injure themselves in a lifetime. That is one in five of us, guys. One in five of us. Name five of your friends, five of your family members, at least one of them has engaged in self-injurious behaviors in order to cope with some really messed up trauma. All right, guys, this is really a lot more common than we'd like to admit. And one thing that tells me is it works. It's not the best way of coping with something, obviously. That's why I'm a therapist, <laughs> but it works. It works for people and it allows them to get through their weeks and their days without doing worse harm to themselves, right? Or literally disassociating and just losing their minds. So I think it's important for us to look at it within that context for just a second. It is also not an attempt to commit suicide. I hear this all the time. Someone might be suicidal and they might experience self-injurious behaviors, but the goal of the self-injurious behaviors is not to commit suicide. Now, again, sometimes someone might attempt suicide and they might mess up, like they cut themselves but their attempt was to die. But this is all something that we can gauge when we, believe it or not, instead of making an assumption, ask them. Usually they'll talk about it if you're really gentle. They want somebody to talk to. They want to not be dealing with this by themselves. But yes, if someone is self-injurious, it does not necessarily mean that they're suicidal yet or at all or ever will be, okay? I think we have to clarify that. Another thing that self-harm is not is attention seeking. In my experience, people who threaten self-harm but don't follow through, they're attention seeking. And even someone who's attention seeking is really sick, guys. If someone is attention seeking by threatening self-harm, we need to be gentle with them and figure out what's going on because it's, you know, the river runs deeper. But Someone who is truly harming themselves, if they're sharing it with you, you are a lucky person that they've felt safe enough to open up to you, okay? Because self-harm is not something someone just does for fun. They're, they're dealing with something. And lastly, self-harm is not something to be taken lightly. So what can you do if you know someone or you yourself are engaging in self-harm? In 2015, researchers asked people who formally cut themselves why they stopped, and there were all kinds of answers, but three of them really stood out to me. Nearly half of them, one, realized that over time and with experience, that feeling that they were feeling when they self-harmed would pass. They started to realize with the wisdom and the growth and the maturity that feelings come and go and they don't die. And they start to just really understand their own resilience, which is a beautiful thing. A quarter of them said they stopped because they started receiving more empathy and love and compassion from someone. Someone was really sweet to them. They entered a friendship or a partnership in which that person just really, really wrapped their arms around them and said, hey, I care about you so much. And that allowed them to heal from whatever trauma was causing them to want to self-harm to begin with. And the remainder of them, in addition to the above situations, just developed better coping mechanisms. And so that self-harm eventually evolved into exercise, joining a sport, getting into art, journal journaling, um, letting themselves cry, uh, what were some of the other things? Listening to music, playing a musical instrument, channeling it into their work. And we have to talk about workaholism. That's not the best thing, but it might be better than self-harm. Um, and even other sensory things like holding and squeezing ice until it melted is a little less damaging than cutting your arm open, um, doing push-ups until they couldn't anymore, things like that ended up replacing self-harm. So I hope this was helpful. I hope this gave you a little more compassion for yourself if you're harming yourself or for someone you know uh, if they are hurting themselves and using this method of coping. and. Yeah, thank you for your question and I will try to get back to more of your questions next week.